Pay attention now, because this is going to get tricky. This guy is not that guy. That guy is this guy. He is not the first guy. This is the first guy. And just to make it perfectly clear, this second guy and the first guy are not this guy. That's a totally different guy. That's, that's the Superman guy. Y you got it? If you don't, don't feel bad because people have been getting these actors confused for many, many years. And we're going to try to straighten it out for you in this episode. This episode, three acting giants you might think are the same guy. Oh, and please subscribe to this channel. Now, we're going to talk about all three of these actors, but let me introduce probably the most famous one first. This is Ted Cassidy, and he will always be identified as Lurch from the Adams Family. While these actors did somewhat resemble each other, I think they were all very tall and physically imposing. I also think their builds were somewhat similar. Our next actor is Richard Keel. And uh, he was best known as Jaws in the James Bond films. He was the tallest of the three actors we're going to talk about today, and he was seven feet two inches tall. The third actor is Jack O'Halloran, and he was not as tall as the others. He was six foot six, but still very imposing. And I think he's probably best known for uh, the Superman movie where he played Non, and uh, he was. Commander Zod's giant henchman. Ted Cassidy and Richard Keel uh, were contemporaries, and uh, Jack O'Halloran, he came along just a little bit later, but it was very, very common for people to get the three of them confused. This would greatly annoy Ted Cassidy, and uh, we're going to talk about that in just a bit. While they do share some uh, interesting physical similarities, their stories are all very different and extremely interesting. Ted Cassidy was born in 1932. Despite always playing big and rather stupid characters during his acting career, he was actually extremely intelligent. You know, as I researched his life, it became a bit painful to read because his large and rather unusual appearance did not reflect on who he was and his talent as an actor. And this problem became more and more difficult for him and frustrating for him as time went on. Cassidy was identified as a gifted student, and at six years old, he was already promoted to the third grade. When he started high school, he was only 11, and yet he was already over six feet tall. He loved sports, especially basketball and football, but because of his age, he was greatly bullied by the older students. I found that very sad and a bit ironic because when you look at him, he looks like the type that would be the bully, and yet he was the one who was being bullied because of his size. He later went to college and he played basketball for Stetson University, where he also got involved in student government, and he graduated with a degree in speech and drama, and then he got married. He spent the next few years working on radio and television until he got his big break when he landed the role of Lurch in The Addams Family. Now, Lurch was originally supposed to be a non-speaking role, but one day during rehearsal, he cracked everyone up when he said, in his ridiculously deep bass voice when he was summoned. From that point on, they began writing dialogue for the character, and Lurch became a bit of a cultural icon for a while. Here's a little bit of trivia. Most people don't know that he played two characters on The Addams Family. Aside from Lurch, he also played Thing. Thing was the hand that would pop out of boxes that were around the house. Cassidy and the show capitalized on the popularity of his Lurch character by making an episode called Lurch, the Teenage Idol in the spring of 1965. And then Cassidy followed up with the release of a pop song and dance called The Lurch. Here he is performing it on the TV show Shindig. 
But it wasn't long before Cassidy realized he was becoming too identified with his Lurch character, and it began to terrify him. He could see that it was going to make it very difficult for him to get other roles in the future. While he loved the cast and the crew, he wanted out as Lurch. He said in an interview with Starlog magazine that Lurch was an albatross around his neck. He was quoted as saying, This is terrible. I want nothing to do with this character. It's ruining me. Well, he, he got his wish because the Adams Family was canceled after the 1966 season. But his instincts were right. Cassidy spent much of the rest of his career being cast as a thug, criminal, or monster. This was very hard on him. Probably his highest profile role was as Harvey Logan in the 1969 blockbuster film Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. But of course, his character was again a thug who tried to take over Paul Newman's gang. He also did a memorable episode of Star Trek that fans of the show love, playing a monstrous machine man who Captain Kirk had to deal with. It's interesting to note that as he struggled to separate himself from Lurch, he mentioned that one of his favorite roles was in a Lost in Space episode called The Thief from Outer Space. While he certainly didn't get to play a leading man type, his character was a slave and he finally got to be something other than a monster. If you ever catch the episode, you can see he's really throwing himself into the role. Cassidy did find his niche in doing voices for cartoons Hi, and for narrating. You're welcome, soldier. He was the voice of Frankenstein Jr. along with many other superhero cartoons in the 1960s and the 1970s. It was a bit of a surprise then that he agreed to do an Adams Family reunion show in 1977, more than a decade after the show last aired. He admitted later that he worked a lot of jobs he wasn't crazy about because they paid the bills. But after struggling for so long with being typecast, one thing that really annoyed him was being mistaken for actor Richard Keel. Ted Cassidy was a highly trained actor who once played the lead as Henry VIII in The Royal Gambit. He was insulted when people confused him with Keel, and it made him so upset that he even considered quitting acting. I have to admit, I even confused the two actors a few years back. There was a Disney film I saw as a kid, and it was called Gus. One segment I recalled had former football great Dick Butkus angrily confront an unseen Ted Cassidy in a car at a drive-in theater. As Cassidy stands up through his sunroof, he gets taller and taller and taller, while Butkus backs away in horror. I remember searching in Cassidy's acting credits for the film Gus, and it wasn't in his history. I was sure they'd made a mistake. After finally coming across the clip online, I learned, of course, it was not Cassidy, but Keel. I want to preface this next part with a few comments. From everything I've read, Ted Cassidy was a warm, engaging, and friendly man. But I think his instant success as Lurch and then his subsequent struggle getting decent acting roles over the next decade wore on him. And whether he knew it at the time of the interview or not, he had a malignant tumor on his heart, and he may not have been feeling real well. But, as I'd mentioned, Cassidy was not happy about people confusing him with Keel, and also having to always play roles where his character was stupid. He spoke openly about it in this interview in Starlog magazine. There's another actor out there by the name of Richard Keel who has done... The Longest Yard, Silver Streak, and The Spy Who Loved Me. Now, there are quite a few people who believe that's me when they see him, which distresses me beyond telling. There was a point at which I was ready to get out of the business because of that. Because he is not an actor. Not to me, he isn't. He does his best, but if that's acting, then I'm a bricklayer. I can't really bear the residual effects of what he has done yet, I have to bear them because apparently half the world thinks that's me and I guess they think what I do is him. I don't know. But for somebody to tell me, oh, the spy who loved me was just terrific. I don't think it's terrific. It was awful. That's the big, dumb, brute character again and I will not be known as that big, dumb brute. They always make fellows like me the big, dumb glute. The oaf who doesn't know anything, who trips over himself. We are apparently idiots, all big men. 
you end up never leading anybody to anything. You end up holding people while the boss hits them in the face, scratching your head a lot, wondering where all your marbles went. Well, that kind of thing doesn't appeal to me at all. I used to think, well, that's how it was and I would do it, but I won't do it anymore. There's no record that I could find of Keel responding or even if he was aware of these comments, but if he was, it had to be a bit painful. In January of 1979, Cassidy had surgery to remove that tumor from his heart. He went home to recover, but had to return after he developed complications. Sadly, he died shortly after this. He was only 46. Next up is the aforementioned Richard Keel, who was born in Michigan in 1939. But the family moved to Los Angeles when he was nine years old. As a child, he suffered from a condition known as acromegaly. The disease causes the pituitary gland to produce too much growth hormone, and that often causes gigantism. Aside from growing extraordinarily tall, it also made him blind in one eye. The condition caused him to be 6 feet 4 inches tall by the time he was in 10th grade, and when he graduated from high school, he was 7 feet tall. Not long after graduating, he decided he wanted to become an actor, so he found a directory of agents, and he worked his way through the directory from A to Z, and he had a don't call us, we'll call you experience. Not a one was interested. Apparently there wasn't a big need for seven feet two inch actors. He finally managed to get himself a couple roles as bad guys in television before he was able to get an agent. One of his first roles was an alien in a chilling Twilight Zone episode from 1959 called To Serve Man. Turns out the book that Keel's alien character had been carrying around had the title To Serve Man. At the end of the episode, humans found out that it was a cookbook. While trying to support himself as he tried to find steady work as an actor, Keel worked in numerous jobs, including a nightclub bouncer and even a cemetery plot salesman. From 1963 to 1965, he worked as a night school math instructor to supplement his income. Another early acting job was as a thug in The Rifleman. Chuck Connors was the star of the show, and he stood a towering six feet, six inches tall. It might have been the only time that a fellow actor actually made Connors look small. Soon he was popping up in many TV shows like Gilligan's Island, The Monkees, and I Dream of Jeannie. One thing you will notice is that he rarely spoke in these early roles, and if he did, they dubbed in the voice of another actor. His first big screen role, where he had some lines and got noticed, was in Burt Reynolds' The Longest Yard. He showed that he had some personality when, despite his intimidating size, he turned out to be a bit of a crybaby. Then came Silver Streak, and later he was offered the role in an obscure sci-fi film being made called Star Wars? They wanted him to be Darth Vader, but he decided instead to take the role of Jaws in The Spy Who Loved Me, because he felt Vader's mask would limit his acting. Now, here's an interesting bit of trivia. Keel was actually the first Incredible Hulk. After two days of filming, though, it was decided he just wasn't bulky enough for the role. He was paid for his work and then replaced by Lou Ferrigno. There isn't much left of Keel's Hulk appearance, but this is a photo from a short clip that they still used of Keel in the series. Ironically, the narrator of The Incredible Hulk show was Ted Cassidy. I wonder if their paths ever crossed. Awkward. By this time, Keel had been married and was raising a family. He also started drinking very heavily. He had made friends with fellow drinker and actor Robert Shaw when filming Force 10 from Navarone. And when Shaw collapsed and died in 1978 at only the age of 51, it had a profound effect on Keel. He wanted to be a better father to his kids and realized he had a drinking problem. He said he had pushed Christianity into the background for years while pursuing his career. After praying and asking God for deliverance, he said, the terrible urge to drink left him, and it never returned. 
like Cassidy, Kill could get frustrated with being confused with other big men like Fred Gwynn, Andre the Giant, and of course, Ted Cassidy. But he did have one amusing story to tell about that confusion. Keel had been away from home when Ted Cassidy died, and for some time afterward. When he returned home, he noticed one of his neighbors staring at him and looking very uncomfortable. When Keel approached him and asked what the problem was, the neighbor said, I thought you were dead. The one thing I found consistent after doing research on Keel is how everyone who knew him loved him and spoke of him being such a warm and humble person. A director he'd worked with said he might have had teeth of steel, but he had a heart of gold. As Keel got older, the effects of his disease on his body and a truck accident caused him to have difficulties walking. He then started using a walking stick and a battery-powered scooter to cover long distances. Keel passed away after having a heart attack in 2014 at the age of 74. He was just three days away from turning 75. Our last big guy is Jack O'Halloran. His temperament and his story is very different from Cassidy's and Keel's. O'Halloran was born in Philadelphia in 1943, where he grew up with his mother, stepfather, sisters, and brother. While he never met his biological father, when he was a teenager, some men visited him and told him that his biological father had just died. I'm sure that was disturbing enough, but the next thing he learned was even more shocking. His dad was a guy named Albert Anastasia. Who was that? Anastasia just happened to be in the Mafia and was the leader of something called Murder, Inc., a group of contract killers. In fact, Anastasia had just been gunned down while getting a haircut, and it's believed that the hit was done by a rival family. While Jack never met Anastasia, uh, Jack had a terrible temper, and any time something happened to make him mad in his teens, his mom would say, You're just like your father. A few years later, Jack finished high school, and he'd been an above-average athlete, so he went to play football for Western Kentucky after being offered a scholarship. As he neared graduating from college, he began thinking of trying out for the Philadelphia Eagles, but then he veered into boxing. He figured he liked to fight, so he thought he may as well get paid for it. He played football at six foot six and 285 pounds, and so he had to train down to a 225 pound fighting weight. He was undefeated in his first 16 fights and won the California State Heavyweight title. What's kind of amazing is that he never had an amateur fight, turning pro immediately. Over the years, he fought some of the top heavyweights in the world, like Ken Norton, George Foreman, and others. He even came close to fighting Muhammad Ali, but the deal fell through. It was shortly before the Norton fight that his world turned upside down again. A doctor told him he had acromegaly, the very same disease Richard Keel had. But O'Halloran was offered a chance at a procedure that might stop his disease. He said only one in a thousand were eligible for a course of action that might cure him. Doctors wanted to use something called a psychotrauma protein beam on him. If it was successful, it would be able to destroy the tumor on his pituitary gland. Well, incredibly, it worked. But his boxing career was over, so he retired from boxing in 1974 and decided to try his hand at acting. Surprisingly, he was offered the role as ex-convict Moose Malloy in the 1975 Robert Mitchum film Farewell, My Lovely. He became lifelong friends with Mitchum, and critics liked his performance. He was then offered the role of Jaws in the James Bond film The Spy Who Loved Me, but he turned it down because he didn't like the character. He says he regretted it afterwards because, of course, Keel took the job as Jaws, and it made him famous. He said in an interview that he's often mistaken for Keel, and then he added what so many others had stated, that Keel was just one of the nicest guys you'll ever meet. But shortly after turning the role of Jaws down, O'Halloran got offered the role he is most identified with, that of Non in the Superman films. One kind of surprising revelation that recently came out 
is that O'Halloran did not like Christopher Reeve. In a few interviews, he claimed that Reeve believed his own publicity a little bit too much and that he acted like a little kid. He said Reeve walked around pretending to be Superman and Clark Kent all the time. He was a 28-year-old with a 16-year-old brain. And he claimed that Reeve was rude to a lot of people. In fact, at one point, their relationship got so bad that he had Reeve pushed up against a wall and he was going to hit him. But the director ran over and begged him not to hit Reeve in the face. After reading about this conflict, I get the feeling that Reeve was probably just a bit immature for his age and it got on O'Halloran's nerves, since they came from very different places in life. O'Halloran does add that after Reeve's accident, that he felt that he became a much nicer person. In 2011, O'Halloran came out with a book called Family Legacy. The book is a fictional memoir based on the life of his father, Albert Anastasia. O'Halloran is now 76 years old and continues to take occasional acting jobs. Well, that was a long one, wasn't it? Um, there was just so much to all three of these guys. I just uh, I felt I didn't even do them justice because I could have actually made this probably twice as long. But thanks for watching. I did not know that. It's going to help me if you subscribe and share this. See you next time.